What of forgiveness? Why have a Levitical priesthood? Why have forgiveness? Why have these provisions if it all hangs on my obedience? And a flawed obedience at that, an inadequate obedience at that. Welcome to Mid-America Reform Seminary's Roundtable Podcast, a broadcast where the faculty of Mid-America discuss everything from Reformed theology, cultural issues, and all things seminary. This is episode 97, and I'm your host, Jared Luchibor. Thank you for tuning in. After introducing the doctrine of republication, Reverend Andrew Compton, Dr. Marcus Minninger, and Dr. J. Mark Beach continue this conversation now as they turn to the biblical data. What does scripture itself have to say about this? Listen as they turn to passages from both Old and New Testaments to assess this perspective on the Mosaic Covenant. What we wanted to do this uh, in this episode is talk through some of the passages in the Old and in the New Testament as well um, that have sort of occasioned modern discussion of republication because there's there's a number of them uh, that, that are sort of higher index uh, in the discussion. And that, of course, gets is, you know, if I can speak a bit anecdotally, I think that's that's what how I came to all this discussion. In teaching Old Testament, I'm looking at a lot of these passages and, and for me, asking the question, does the republication approach um, provide a helpful set of tools for interpreting this passage? You know, do these passages hold up uh, or, or do they sort of break out of a, of a mold provided by republication? And conversely, if somebody is not holding to a republication approach in, in any way, let's say, um, does their approach to these passages make sense? And it seems to me, you know, we, um, well, we, we could say a number of things about what's commendable and what isn't, but I know that as I came to this, one of the things that stood out to me that could be called a form of republication is how uh, our Lord Jesus Christ um, bore the curses of the broken covenant of works. He bore that under the forms of the Old Testament theocracy, right? The fact that Jesus Christ was crucified on a cross um, was a curse from Deuteronomy. And in fact, Paul in Galatians 3.13 uh, describes that as significant. There's, there's some sense in which the administration of the theocracy under the Mosaic covenant was a suitable venue uh, for playing out um, or for enabling our Lord to uh, to bear the curse and secure all righteousness. And that, that's just kind of an example of, of how this uh, approach gets us thinking of ways to explain some of these textual details. But there are a number of other passages, and we can look at a few, but but a number that um, that really seem to drive the discussion. I think in in general, it, to to boil this down again for a, a kind of an entry level uh, orientation to the topic, in my mind, there are two big categories of texts that primarily generate the questions and the concern and, and lead towards the republication f- formulation. And and this is, you know, maybe others would say it differently, but. Um, one one category would be texts in the Old Testament where Israel is uh, told that their bless their obedience or their disobedience would lead to either blessing or curse uh, in their life in the land, um, and there are a lot of those that relate to to that topic in some way or another. But you know, prominent among them would certainly be Deuteronomy twenty seven twenty eight. Uh, this pronouncement of blessings, pronouncement of curses, uh, even looking ahead, if you obey, you know, your crops will be blessed and your cattle, etc., and you'll retain the land. And if you disobey, uh, then then all these different curses will come upon you. And so the basic question, in a sense, you could say is, um, is God treating Israel? Is he is he acting towards Israel there in the in the exact same basic way that he acts towards us today in the new covenant or is there something different right is there something different going on there that it, he's treating them on the basis of works um in in some sense that's distinct from um the way we could expect to be treated by the lord or, or relate to the lord and then another category of texts would be uh especially come from paul's letters 
for example, where he sharply distinguishes between uh, law and grace, um, and he will quote from the Old Testament to cite and explain the principle of the law, the, the blessing by works, such as in Galatians 3.12, uh, the famous text where it talks about, but the law is not of faith, uh, which, of course, a, a book was published under that title. So he, Paul quotes from the Old Testament, Deut- uh, Galatians 3.11, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. That's Habakkuk 2, of course. Uh, but verse 12 the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. He's quoting Leviticus 18.5 there as a, um, a text that in some sense articulates the principle of law rather than the principle of grace. And of course, that's drawn from Leviticus, part of the, part of the, uh, part of the um, Pentateuch. Something similar in Romans 10.5, uh, distinctions that are drawn um, where, where between law and grace and the Old Testament, Leviticus 18.5 most likely again cited. Uh, or you can think about uh, 2 Corinthians 3, where um, the, the ministry of Moses is called a ministry of condemnation or ministry of death. Uh, and so some very negative language used about Moses' ministry, 2 Corinthians 3, combined with this law principle being derived from Leviticus 18.5, the Pauline data like that uh, tend to be, you know, right at the heart of this discussion. So on the one hand, Israel's being promised things on the basis of obedience, threatened other things on the basis of disobedience. Okay, there's that. And then on the other, this Pauline language, probably the two big, you know, things that prompt the discussion. But on the other hand, you know, when we have to say, okay, what does that exactly mean, any of those texts, and how does it fit within a broader discussion of other biblical texts as well? And then you can go to a lot of other things. So just to throw out a few other things, for example, in Hebrews 3, 1 through 6, uh, Moses is described as a servant in the house of God, the servant in the house of which Christ is son. So Moses and the son Jesus uh, are ministering in the exact same house for salvific purposes, right? Or J- Jesus says in John, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he spoke of me. Or in Paul's own letters, two, uh, both Abraham and David are especially used as the, the, the prime cases in point of righteousness by faith, right? David living underneath the Mosaic economy, you could say. Um, or the fact that in Romans 10, Paul not only cites Leviticus for the law principle, but he's to cite Deuteronomy 30 for the gospel principle and uh, so forth. So it becomes a complex question um, how to fit all of these pieces together exegetically and biblical theologically. And that's, and that's something of kind of the, the, the heart of why there's all this discussion fr- from a biblical data standpoint. Well, and you, when you read Leviticus 18, verse 5, you know, uh, or I'm sorry, 18, verse, um, yeah, verse 5, you shall therefore, I'm reading from the ESV, you shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am Yahweh, or I am the Lord. You know, and on, a, on its face value, you can see where this would be mustered in servants in service of sort of a, a do and thereby merit even if it's covenantal merit, however we want to construe that, thereby receive the the, the triggering of the blessings. Um, although what what I'm finding interesting, even as I um, even as I look at that, is how it illustrates that no matter how we come to a passage like this, and, and you you alluded to this a moment ago, we have to assume a number of things um, before we can actually derive that meaning. And so, on the one hand, you could say, yes, here's a passage that just simply says keep my rules, do them. If he does them, then as a result, he will live by them. Well, we're not even going to unpack the different Hebrew prepositions um, that are that are being used there. However, if we were to back up a little bit, you do look at the beginning of chapter 18, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes, 
You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. And then we get this verse. And look what's being really contrasted is the life of idolatry, the life of Egyptian religion, the life of Canaanite religion vis-a-vis Yahweh and his rules and his laws, right? And, and I think this is important to look at because it would be easy to right away um, come down and say, well, that just seems simple enough. You know, if you live by, if you do this, you receive them. But when we think through sort of the kinds of ways in which people express obedience, um, right, in the covenant of works, the obedience required was perfect, personal, and perpetual obedience vis-a-vis imperfect obedience at any level, right, a very, very, um, very stark kind of presentation. Whereas in the covenant of grace, what we really seem to be looking at is imperfect, what some, some writers called evangelical obedience, vis-a-vis apostasy. And it seems like that's setting up what, what is happening here in Leviticus 18 is already we're starting to frame things a little differently. But, but then again, that's because I'm, I'm reading this with that, with that reality of the covenant of grace in mind, even as we're looking at, at Leviticus 18 verse 5 here. Well, part of that's important of this discussion is that the covenant of grace doesn't go away even under the Mosaic economy. I mean, that would be an absurdity, that an everlasting covenant is no longer everlasting, that, yeah. nope, stop, boink, nope, uh, now you're under law, not under grace, when in fact those under the Mosaic law were still under grace. Calvin's... Uh, but they weren't living under grace. There's the difference. They weren't looking to grace when they misused the law as a means for uh, their blessedness and salvation, and that as if their obedience could get the job done. Calvin has an interesting take on Leviticus uh, 18.5, and that he has no problem with that the promise that you can be blessed by works or justified by works, but his point is that the promise is uh, of none effect because of human corruption and our inability to fulfill such a call to obedience. There's nothing wrong with the call to obedience. What is God supposed to say? Sin with impunity? Disobey me and flourish? I mean, in that sense, it's almost a proverb in the very good sense of that word. But uh, I'll I'll leave it to uh, you two biblical guys to give a fuller uh, explanation of that. But I think you have to continually factor in the human defect, the human depravity, even under grace, the human flaw. And uh, so Calvin's not afraid to talk about the continual call of obedience, but recognizing even that obedience needs forgiveness, needs mercy, needs justification, <laughs> needs God's warm hug of, of uh, forgiveness and I'm, I'm not sure I hear that as clearly in modern discussions as I think it needs to be heard. I think part of the issue is um, the, the law itself, how would it bless if it's going to bless? It's only on the basis of obedience, right? The law can't bless absent obedience. So that's true of the nature of the law itself. And Paul is making that point. The question is... If those are the terms under which the law can bless, does that ever come to fruition? I think that's part of what you're you're getting at. So if we say that various parts of the Bible remind us of the law's demands and the basis upon which you can be blessed with the law, that should be uncontroversial. They, they do that, and that's important for us to keep in mind. Um, the, the issue is more, was Israel placed underneath the law itself purposefully as the way that they should seek blessing absent grace. I think that's where the difficulties really come in, right? Or is there some measure of grace involved somehow, but there's also some aspect in which they're supposed to seek blessing, not on the basis of grace, but on the basis of works. I think the and the clear antithesis between grace and works is one of the things that ironically sometimes gets blurred somewhat 
in this discussion. Um, and it's ironic because the viewpoint of republication, as it's been articulated in, in recent times, is designed to keep law and gospel, grace and works, very, very separate and distinct, right? But the the problem is, and one of the main problems in, in my view is that Israel is constantly receiving grace and not being treated in any strict sense on the basis of their works. And to then say that they are an, under an administration defined in some sense by works when there's all this grace happening actually produces, in my mind, more unclarity because something that has lots of patience, lots of delay of wrath, uh, lots of graciousness from God is being called works. Whereas in the garden, Adam was very clearly treated simply on the basis of works. Now, I understand that there's different qualifications that will be made, but it's an illustration what we're bringing up, what Mark's bringing up, uh, and the context that Andrew's bringing up in Exodus um, Exodus eight, sorry, Leviticus eighteen is clearly evoking the Exodus, right? Which is grace, which is redemption. So it quickly becomes difficult to see something that can properly be called works in the Mosaic economy because it's redemptive in nature. Paul makes this basic point in his own way in Galatians three. Uh, where he says that even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it after it's been ratified, and that he's appealing to Abraham's experience in Genesis 12 and Genesis 15, where he receives, he's justified by faith and by grace, right? And saying that if that's the way the covenant was designed, that's its substance, it can't in its fundamental nature be changed, right? So what we end up seeing, I think, is that there's more nuance needed in, in my view, or perhaps a different set of categories that were, are most helpful for explaining why the promises of blessing and why the threats of, of curse, uh, why does Paul speak in such stark categories about law and grace and cite Leviticus 18.5, um, but the republication categories themselves to me don't provide the most clarity about all that but you can still see this is what they're trying to wrestle with these yeah. are difficult texts right and they and they require a lot of of effort to unpack and and what i found too i you know i i've on my own sort of pilgrimage through this gone from being very excited about its potential um in particular thinking about justification and the act of obedience of christ and ways in which typologically it foreshadow it can foreshadow that to the more texts I looked at, the more I went, you know, some of these principles don't seem to, they don't seem to be able to bear up under the textual details. And so, for example, you mentioned uh, Abraham in Genesis 12 and 15, where he's commended for his faith. And yet here's something that I found very, very striking. Again, don't get me wrong. I'm not, don't, our, our listeners should not hear us as saying, ah, maybe Rome was right on these points, right? Um, but you look at Genesis 22 after showing his willingness to sacrifice Isaac and the angel of the Lord, the Malachi and I stopping him, um, we find the promises from Genesis 12 and 15 restated yet again, but now in uh, bookended by in 22, 16, by myself, I have sworn because you have done this and not withheld your son, I will surely bless you, et cetera, et cetera. And even ending that, that typical list of, of blessings with, um, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. You know, and that's that's interesting. That that okay, interesting how causal language is being mustered here, and yet nobody is is really suggesting that that Rome gets it right when they appeal to James, as though Genesis twenty two is really teaching Rome's system. And I think we have a number of things where we we deal with this question of causality. Is there this nice clean? triggering mechanism of blessing and curses related to obedience. Uh, just a few examples I should throw out here. You know, uh, the this approach is very clear that Israel lived by grace and, and that any works that we're talking are at a level of physical existence, not their eternal soul. Uh, and, and we can, you know, we can deal with the difficulty of what that would be like to live under that bifurcation. But But my point is simply even within the idea of these physical, temporal blessings being triggered 
by obedience, there's some things that break down there too. The, the, the claim is that, well, who has to be obedient? Is it every single Israelite? Because that never happened. Um, well, well, Klein at least said there needed to be some type of typological legibility to Israel's obedience. When enough of the nation um, was obedient to a sufficient degree to typify blessings in the new creation, then that enabled them to stay in the land. And in that sense, he's, he's holding very closely to language Voss used. Um, but having said that, we have to then say, well, when did that typological appropriateness of expression kick in as a requirement? And, you know, some would say, well, at Sinai. Well, but they weren't in the land for some time after Sinai. When, when did this kick in? Did they not need to show this until then? Um, you know, when, when does that need for typological legibility kick in? Uh, is it um, is it in Joshua when the land has rest from war, or is it in Judges two six where we actually have the language of Nahala and Yarash, this this inheriting of the land coming in? Right. That's that's just it, it starts to break down there. And add to that um, the the it's generally framed by republication, that Israel entered the land by grace, was given the land by grace, but merely retained it by uh, by obedience. However, there's a slate of a spate of passages in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 4, verse 1, for example, and now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you, and do them that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you. Same con- same sentiments in Deuteronomy 6, verse 18, in Deuteronomy 11, verse 8, Deuteronomy 11, verses 22 and 23. I'm not trying to just throw these out. Our listeners can go do a little reading on these. But but what I'm trying to show is, is that at least with regard to some of these points that, that Republication is trying to give us clarity on, too rigid of an application of it actually can't make sense of other passages. I think you maybe and, say and what of number. what of forgiveness? Why have a Levitical priesthood? Why have right? forgiveness? Why have these provisions if it all hangs on my obedience and a flawed obedience at that, an inadequate obedience at that? I, I just find uh, pressing this hard. I think creates more problems than it solves. Though I readily admit it's dealing with difficult problems. But is Israel driven from the land because she just wasn't obedient enough or because she had apostatized? Was Israel uh, driven from the land and failed to retain it because they didn't have 51% of the congregation of the people having some zeal for the Lord? Or was it she was a people that didn't live by faith, didn't trust God's word, didn't walk with him in love? and didn't ask for his mercy and grace in all of their failure. And a complicating factor to that, sorry to, to butt in, what you're on a great great train, I don't want to interrupt, is, is you mentioned the 51%. The ironic thing is 2 Kings 21 and 2 Kings 23 blame Manasseh. They blame <laughs> Manasseh for why they went into exile. They don't even talk about majority or people you know, violating the law. And then before that, you have the question of why are they not kicked out of the land much earlier? Why are they? Why is there any endurance of this people to to enter the land or stay in the land? Right, and and that's that's where again I think to suggest that Israel's being treated on the basis of works, it's so far different from works that I have a hard time seeing why why apply the language of of works in the end. Um, there's there's graciousness and patience and. Um, a, a um, reduced level of obedience and degree of obedience, etc. It's being qualified in, in so many different ways that at some point it seems like, hey, this sounds a lot more like covenantal patience and merciful delay of a judgment deserved, etc. than something that's truly works-based, right? So then the question becomes, you know, should we should we come at these texts and see what they're saying through a different apparatus, through a different set of categories than uh, saying that somehow Israel was being treated on the basis of works uh, like Adam was, except with manifold and, and, and many, many, many 
differences from that, right? Many, many qualifications for how it's actually different from Adam. Republication has been introduced. Biblical data has been assessed. Next time in our final episode for this particular series, we'll hear about the practical implications that this view of republication has. For more episodes, you can find us on our website at midamerica.edu slash podcasts and wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Be sure to search for and subscribe to Mid-America Reform Seminary's Roundtable. I'm Jared Luchibor. Till next time.